Hello and welcome from Bridgerland Village. In this video, I wanted to talk about some of the comments and questions I have received and try to explain or answer them. Probably the most frequent is why I don't use a V-plow. I have a V-plow and I've used it, however, very rarely. This is for several reasons. The first is that V-plows are for parting deep snow and are not very good at carrying snow. So during the course of a plow, plowing a storm, I need the front plow to clear cul-de-sacs and parking areas, make them passable, and pile the snow off the ends and around the edges. I keep from creating a situation that requires a V-plow by continuing to work the wind event, regardless of how long it takes, which has been as long as 36 hours, by cycling through all the worst areas trying not to let them go more than a few hours before I return. If I at least keep a narrow path through the drifting, I can work to open it with the plow and wing later, which I would have to do after the V plow also. It will just lengthen the process to run back and forth to get the V and then return for the straight. When if I work it, as described and don't let up, I can keep the roads open, more accessible. I don't have to close the roads because they've drifted over. Another reason is that the V-plow, although tall, is not as tall as the banks get. So the snow ends up sliding down the bank, into the road, and behind the V. The wing has more reach to the side. With the wing and or the use of articulated angles with the front plow, I can move the snow banks farther off the road and more efficiently. Finally, the V-plow is hard to see around, so less safe in these confined roads, and heavy, so tire and front air wear are increased by carrying it around. In this clip, this is almost exactly the same spot where the prior images with the V-plow were. The drifting is only slightly smaller, yet I am working it side to side with the reversible straight plow. Takes more effort and passes initially, but since on the left there is a high dirt cut bank, I can lift the snow higher and farther off the road with this plow. On the right side, it falls off sharply, and with this plow, I can roll the snow further off, articulating and angling the machine, and letting that side front tire go over the bank with the drive still on the road and have the traction to get back out. The next issue is why I don't go faster to throw the snow farther. I go as fast as practical given the conditions nearly always existing to do just that. I would love to be able to go faster. There are several reasons for this also. The roads are steep in a lot of places and the camera doesn't always reflect that. And the amount of snow I'm moving often requires lots of power. I'm constantly adjusting for obstacles and hazards, the frequency of which is not always apparent in the clips I choose. The roads are narrow, and the edges and banks are not delineated, and in heavy snow, it's hard to see and stay out of or off of those banks, especially going fast. I am often finding them by feel. The drivers using the roads and I cannot see well over the steep banks and the other things that limit visibility. We all need time to react to each other and speed makes that more difficult. Sometimes the banks are very hard when I can get to them and often a pressing of the snow at a slower speed at the base keeps more of it against the bank and less rolls back into the road. There's less bounce, especially when the snow is balling up. I've had some experience with too much speed when the wing hits a heavy hard spot and the grader was flung around nearly 90 degrees with the front going off the road and I got seriously stuck because the road dropped way off. You can see here the grader thrusting to the side, even at these slower speeds. So you can imagine what happens with the energy generated at higher speeds. 
In this clip, there is a hard edge that I am breaking up and pressing into the bank. So then I can get close enough to have a chance to move the rest of the bank in stages farther off the road. The third issue that I get asked a lot is what am I lifting over and avoiding? I thought this would be obvious. However, I realize the item itself is covered in snow and the markers are often barely visible. There are utilities like fire hydrants, phone boxes, and power transformers that I make sure are marked well, but sometimes I lose them in the snow and either cut a wider swath from memory or expose them by hand. There are road signs and trees. There are rocks and boulders above grade, but under the snow, in the road, and on the shoulders. Driveways, landscape boulders, and other decorative items placed by owners. The HOA has not done a great job of protecting the right of way. The original construction of the road is also a problem. The design width and alignment was not always followed, creating narrow roads that are often only 18 to 20 feet wide, with cul-de-sacs that are small and hard to turn around in, or place the snow off of. This also contributes to the issue of owners placing items along the road edge, because their property line is up to the road, and the poor following of the plans shrunk or eliminated the right-of-way in areas, creating hazards for me to avoid. There are high, steep dirt banks that start right at the ditch on the edge of the road in many areas, and this limits getting the snow off the road and creates some of the high snow banks you see, and those snow banks can't be moved on their solid, high dirt base. There are also road edges that drop off sharply, limiting how far I can get over to push the snow off in those places. Those are often across from the steep banks, cut into the slope, so I am limited in places to put snow, and those are often where the wind blows and it drifts a lot. Many of the utilities were not located off the road as they should have been, and are right on the edge if not partially in the road if the road were built to spec and as wide as they should have been. I also get asked about the tire chains and why they are different from front to rear. This is partly because they serve different functions. Since the grader is not an all-wheel drive, the front chains are for lateral stability and steering, so the heavier chain in the diamond pattern lends itself better for this purpose. They create more side resistance over the regular ladder style. The rears are more for traction and braking, so the ladder style with the more frequent two-link spacing over this wider four work well for that. The heavy diamond, like the front has, would probably do that job well also, but are more expensive. They are all made of a quality alloy that wears much better than the standard quality I used to use that I would have to build the links up on every year with a welder. The reason I have wheels on the front plow and have built shoes for the blades is to adjust them so a little snow is left on the road. This is to protect the gravel surface of the road it also makes it so owners can ride their snow machines around and up to the back country. That snow also helps create a hard packed surface that is easier to plow because then I can float the blades on it. I built the quick attach plow mount to be able to switch between the straight and the V plow more easily. I also completely changed the swing cylinders and mounts to bring them above the frame and make them stronger, which allows me to push the banks better and plow more efficiently. Some have also wondered about my contract. I am in the second season of my second five season contract. 
So I've been doing this for seven years so far. It pays a set amount each season, regardless of the amount of snow. This is assumed to even out the light and heavy years and make the cost more predictable for the HOA and give me a certain amount for having to stage equipment that then is out of other revenue generating possibilities. It had been working out that way in the first five years, but these last two have really hurt me with record snow last year. And I think we're in a top five this year for snow. I get a payment of a little more than a half in the fall before I start to operate on and the rest plus a fuel surcharge in the spring. I did write in a clause that allows me to negotiate for more in extreme unusual circumstances. And last year, due to the record snow, I was able to get some for a loader I hired to help with the banks, but I still lost significant money. I'm a little in the hole this year over if I had billed it hourly. And it is also just me, my grader my, and my truck for the over eight miles of road and the associated lots and cul-de-sacs. I have no real backup, which is made for some interesting accommodations and stress due to injuries and surgeries I've had. But I've been able to always keep the roads open. Breakdowns must be resolved quickly, and so maintenance is important. One local contractor with a smaller loader could possibly keep the roads open for a short time if needed, but he is not always available and he would struggle in a big storm or wind event. Lastly, I thought I would give you a little background on me. I have spent basically six months of each of the last seven years plowing here under contract for snow removal and I do grading in the summer. This overlapped with my heavy haul trucking operation as well as driving and operating for a large construction company. I had a 20 year career in law enforcement as a state trooper that I retired from in 2010 when I picked up with my heavy haul trucking business full time. In 2000, I started Hudson Enterprises as a side gig to my public service job as a grading and excavating contractor. Before law enforcement, I was a truck and heavy equipment mechanic, so I do most of my own repairs and maintenance. All of this helped to bring me to this point. I end with my grandson, who I'm sure will aspire to and achieve much more but here he is an operator in training.